All right. Thanks everybody for joining me tonight. I uh, just wanted to try to make the best of uh, some equipment failures that I've had, but uh, I think we're going to be all right tonight. Uh, I wanted to go to a, an interview format with this show for the most part, and I spent most of my time over the last month getting set up for that. But unfortunately, uh, still getting new to the whole idea of trying to invite guests, you know, guests to do the interviews with. But um, I want to go over a few things uh, this week uh, before hopefully next week we actually start in an interview series, which uh, I'll be going over some of that today. Um, the first thing, as earlier this week I, uh, I wrote a uh, paper that I posted in probably a lot of the forms that you may have uh, been able to see this on. And uh, the, the heading of it was you know, perfect is the enemy of good. Uh, it's, it's also available on uh, promorum.liberty.me, which is, uh, you know, the, the Liberty Me uh, publishing site for myself. There's a couple of papers in there that are interesting, and I, I hope they're, they're useful tools for people. Uh, everything in there is on the Creative Commons uh, attribution, so anybody's free to use any of that stuff. Uh, this video, uh, when it's posted to my channel, I don't, I don't know about the Voluntary Virtues Network, but it'll be posted on both channels. Um, it's going to be also on Creative Commons, so anybody's free to use any excerpts from this, whether you think that I made a good point during the show, or if you just think that, you know, being my first show, it was funny enough to, you know, have a good time with. Whichever one you want to do, have a good time. Um, so, back to the idea of perfect is the enemy of good. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting concept. I, uh, I saw it in a, a David Hewitt video. Uh, for those of you who uh, are like sci-fi fans, he is the, uh, the gentleman that paid Dr. McKay on Stargate Atlantis. So, you know, he's got a pretty active YouTube channel. It's, uh, it's, it's interesting, and uh, particularly that video uh, helped give me the kick in the butt I needed to, to get doing some, some writing and stuff. The writing's easier because, you know, people don't see you and, and won't be, you know, it's not, I don't, it's not as personal, I guess. You know, the, the writing is something you can do it, mold it, you know, go back, edit it again, and so you can get a, a fair degree of polish on it. Uh, this video, this is going to be kind of like Survivor Man, except for it's going to be 25 minutes straight through. So, no takes, no nothing. So, um, but the, the, as far as perfect, the, the enemy of good goes, um, it, it's an interesting concept. Um, it basically says that, you know, we're not perfect. And people like myself, uh, we get in this almost utopian nirvana fallacy thing where we think that we have to deliver perfect product and uh... i've, I've been foolish in the past um, two years i've been thinking about making youtube videos and and i'm finally getting around to it um, the the articles I, I put that off for a long time too and it's just just plain silliness you know you think that well if you can't do anything uh, if you do something less than your very, very best, then it's not good enough. And, and, and if it's not good enough, then why try? But, uh, you know, as Edmund Burke said, you know, if good, all that evil needs to prosper is that good men sit by and do nothing. Uh, I'm sure that's paraphrased, but that's, that's right. You know, we, if we don't get out there, we don't touch, you know, people and get to know other people, you know, they're, they're going to be left with the status thinking that they're engaging in every day. They're not going to question things. And if they don't question, they, uh, they'll never get past it. Um, me personally, I, I owe, you know, a thanks to, I mean, if you want to follow the whole progression, I owe a thanks to uh, Rush Limbaugh for getting me from being uh, on the path to being a communist. You know, so at least he got my mindset going. I mean, obviously Rush didn't, uh, didn't get me here. But, you know, uh, 2012, with the video, or with the election for that year, uh, Ron Paul, I mean, he, uh, he woke me up. I probably uh, started 
learning about Ron Paul after the 2008 election. I wasn't involved in that one. But uh, later on down the road, and, and it really came back to the whole sound money. Uh, that was really the, the way that I came into it. You know, I... Uh, You know, I can't thank, you know, Ron Paul enough, but it's funny, once you, uh, you start on the road, you just can't be satisfied, you know, especially if you've got that perfectionist mindset. You know, if you follow the progression to where that's leading to, you know, taxation is theft. You know, if I don't want to give my money to somebody, and it's my personal property, I mean, if I own myself, then I own the fruit of my labor. If I own the fruit of my labor, then I own all the money that my company was supposed to pay to me or my customer was supposed to give to me. And if the government takes that from me, like they actually have a superior claim on the ownership for that money, and they don't ask me and I don't consent to it, then they've stolen it from me. And I, I've heard people talk about how, you know, if... I don't have the right to take money from other people as taxation. How can I give that right to other people? And I don't think that was the mindset that, you know, the taxation started off with. It really kind of comes down back more to uh, consent. You know, you have... It, it, by the way, this is going to be a distinction without a difference because it's going to amount to the same thing in the, the long run. If I give, you know, if I, if, I sign a, if I sign a paper and give somebody my consent to have some of my money, then I can consent to taxation that way. You know, I can consent to fees, especially user fees. I mean, that's, that's a much more reasonable thing. But I can consent, you know, people consent all the time to give them 10% of their income to the church. And, you know, government, well, they, get, uh, they get jealous and they want their percentage too. So where the, you have every right to not give the money to the church, and as a Christian, you, you don't have to give your money to the church. It's, it's supposed to be something that you do willingly. So the, the church can't demand the money, but the state does. So we've come to the point where it, it's a distinction without a difference, because when you withdraw consent, it becomes theft. Uh, the Nirvana fa fallacy is interesting. Uh, it's something that all ANCAPs should know about, or voluntarists, because it, it's basically what you get every time you get into an argument with a statist. You know, our uh, argument or discussion, whatever you want to call it. The, the problem is they're saying that we as ANCAPs have to know perfectly what is going to happen if we should happen to get, you know, our way and they're able to be free. You know, with their freedom, they think, oh, who's going to take care of me? Now, they should be able to take care of themselves, shouldn't they? Isn't that the whole idea? Is that as a, as a, you know, a person who's free, you know, you now have complete responsibility for yourself. You can't hand that over to anybody else. Now, in the free market, you know, naturally, you're going to have, you know, companies that you're going to be able to, you know, hire for services. You know, not everybody wants to cut their own off. They don't have the time. You know, it, it doesn't always make sense to have the equipment. You know, you know, we do that kind of thing. You know, the, we just, you know, separate different tasks. You know, a lot of people don't want to make videos like this. And uh, there's a whole, whole mess of things that are really important that uh, a lot of us can't do, don't want to do, or, or can't, I mean, just don't have the capability of doing it. Um, so, and where the Nirvana fallacy comes into place is, is just that how is one man going to actually know how, well, when we're talking about the United States, how is one man going to know how 313 million people are going to interact on a daily basis and, and do it without the state? You know, for the most part, we do that now. It's very rare that, you know, we interact with the state and usually it's not in a positive way. I mean, I can't think of times when I interact with the state and it's a, a positive experience. 
I mean, the state's always holding, you know, the gun to your head. And not literally, but figuratively. An officer pulls you over on the side of the road, it's not going to be a pleasant experience for you. You know, he's always going to get something from you. Not immediately, but down the road. You know, it's it's rare that you even get an officer these days that will pull you over, tell you your taillight's out, and not write you the ticket. Because he's, you know, he's got a job to do. And it ain't being your friend. And, you know, anybody who tells you that the cops are your friends, you know, they're, they're people that are ready to victimize you as, as part of their job. So, it, it, they're not your friend. You get over that. And, and, and as far as the Nirvana fallacy goes, you know, when you get people putting you on the spot, just put them on the spot right back and, uh, and tell them, look, I, I don't know what you think, but the situation that we're in now, where there's a government here in the U.S., the government's not doing a great job. They've run up a debt bigger than there's ever been before. They took over the health care system, and they can't even handle the VA system, which has been around for a long time. The police pull you over, they beat people to death, and they're not punished. You know, if I pull somebody over to the side of the road and beat them to death, I, I go to prison forever. You know, if I'm in Texas, maybe they execute me. But if a Texas cop does that to a person, well, he usually gets a, a paid vacation. You know, they call it an administrative leave, but it's a paid vacation. And then uh, before you know it, he's back out on the street. You know, if he's smart he uh, and he has a camera on him, he has a camera malfunction. And conveniently, there was a, a one, there's an article going the rounds on uh, on Facebook right now where this guy has had like three convenient camera malfunctions. And, I mean, that alone should be a disciplinary action. You know, you have problems with cameras over and over again. Why is that? Nobody else does. You know, that right there should be, you know, uh, should be some kind of situation. But, you know, they don't, uh, they don't give it a lot of thought. And uh, then the other thing that happens is, you know, just this is collectivist thinking that, you know, it, it, it's funny. Um, actually, just before doing this video, I was in talking to some guys in uh, one of the groups that uh, I'm in, uh, the anarcho-capitalist community on Facebook. And I don't know how long uh, this one gentleman uh, has, has been uh, an anarcho-capitalist, but he's still engaging in a lot of collectivist thinking. You know, he, uh, he thinks that everybody in China and Russia is just anxious to shoot people because they're all descended from Genghis Khan. Um, irregardless of the fact that, you know, if you look at, um, well, they, they actually do genetic testing, and they, they see a, a large portion of the population in China, and, and maybe even around the world, uh, does have, like, some kind of link back to with who they think was Genghis Khan. But it's like 10% at the most. So how do you generalize everybody in China and Russia off from somebody who may have, like, fathered 10% or been the ancestor of 10% of the population? So that 10% is going to totally control the rest of those two countries in this guy's mind. And, you know, he cares about us. And, you know, I, I honestly can say, you know, we've all kind of been there. <laughs> so, you know, I you can't really hold that against somebody. But, you know, and, and kind of remind that, remember that too, is most of us, at some point have engaged to some degree in, in, in status thinking, you know, and we've come back to being anarcho-capitalists. I think we're kind of all born that way, but we, we come back to it. And uh, I think Robert Higgs thinks that it's probably the result of some kind of genetic quirk. So we, uh, we were sort of predestined to be anarcho-capitalists if we got around to uh, actually being exposed to it. So... So we do need to expose other people to it so that they can at least come home to, to anarcho-capitalist thinking, which is it's a very freeing experience. Um, the shows that I want to do, um, there's been, uh, um, 
There's been a lot of uh, talk about Bitcoin. It's very you know very big in the uh, in the liberty movement as a whole. Uh, really big for anarcho capitalists, but a lot of people don't think it's money. And uh, I'm going to be doing a, an article on that, and you know I want to lay out the case really well. Uh, there was a, a recent article written by um, Mr. LaRue on the Voluntary Virtues uh, Network uh, website, and uh, it was a really well written article. I, I've got to, i got to say that. Um, <laughs> not a lot of people agreed with it in some ways. They, you know, when you, you become a fan of Bitcoin, uh, you kind of want to defend it. So that's uh, not really what I want to do with my article. Uh, it's going to be uh, a little bit different view on that. Uh, it's mostly just, you know, thinking the situation through. Um, but it's going to, I think, make things a little bit clearer for some people, hopefully. I think Bitcoin, you know, is, a, is an extremely valuable uh, tool for us. In a situation where, and, and I'll get more into this in the article, but, you know, in a situation like this where we, we all know that the guns of the state are to our heads, and we're all forced to use the dollar, the renminbi, the peso, the ruble, the euro, you know, take your pick, the yen. You know, we're forced to use those. The Bitcoin came in, and now you've got, you know, alternate, you know, cryptocurrencies also. But it came into play where it's in a situation where, although it's public, you know, as far as the ledger goes, we're in a situation where we can actually use the, you know, use Bitcoin, use these cryptocurrencies, and we can actually get around the state. And so who was it? TDV, uh, the Dollar Vigilante, uh, had an article on this. Uh, it wasn't written by Jeff Berwick, but it was written by another gentleman. And he had a graphic in there, which I will uh, see if I can you know, attribute and put in my article too. But it was very useful because there are uh, companies that move money around through the world. Uh, you know, er everybody's probably heard of Western Union. And here, yet, Bitcoin has already gotten to the point where it handles more money, you know, on a yearly basis than, than Western Union. And Western Union has been around for a long time. So, you know, with a very short period of time, and, and, and there's no fees, you know, to speak of in the same way that there are with Western Union. There, Western Union is very heavy with fees. And my uh, my wife is from Colombia. And, you know, her mother, who passed away recently, um, we used to send her money. And Western Union took a healthy uh, chunk of our uh, our cash that was being sent down there. So... You know, and then you know when the the country uh, the, the U.S. started engaging in some capital controls, uh, Western Union actually told us they wouldn't let us send money down to Colombia anymore. I don't know what they, maybe they thought that because we were sending money on a regular basis that uh, you know we were buying drugs or something. I don't know how much drugs you can get for what little bit of money we were able to send, but you know I, I, they don't bother explaining themselves to you because you're nothing. But, uh, you know, we were able to find other ways to get money down to her, fortunately. But, you know, with Bitcoin, that's not even necessary. I don't have to ask permission to, to move my money, in, well, my currency, anywhere in the world. So that's a good thing. But, uh, you know, Bitcoin, as good as it is, you know, I, I don't think that there's ever a situation where we would want to use Bitcoin in and of itself exclusively. I mean, it's, it's, it's great, but, you know, the, uh, I don't know how many people are even familiar with, you know, local currencies, or uh, they also call them like alternate currencies and stuff like that, but uh, local currencies are actually very useful. Um, and, you know, most of them have what I consider to be uh, kind of a, a flaw in that they're you know, pegged to the U.S. dollar. You know, on the world market, currencies typically, 
at least the majors, fluctuate against each other. So if uh, everybody likes Japan a little bit more right now and thinks Japan has been making some better decisions than, say, the Russians, then the, the yen compared to the, the ruble, you know, will actually go up in value. And uh, maybe like maybe the best example for a lot of people who are in the northern U.S. is the Canadian dollar has actually gone up in value against the U.S. dollar. I remember a time when I was a kid when the, uh, the Canadian dollar was worth like 74, 76 cents. You know, it's going back away. It's going back like 30, 40 years. But, you know, that's, that's what we're talking. And here now, I, I think that the U.S. dollar is actually a little bit less valuable than the Canadian dollar, just because the, the Canadian dollar is a, a resource currency, you know, especially with the, uh, the tar sands that they have up there. So the local currency is doing that same thing, where they're pegged to the dollar. It's, it makes bookkeeping easier. It definitely does. And when you're trying to adopt a currency, or you're trying to, uh, even on the world stage, you know, the renminbi was pegged to the dollar for quite a while. I don't know if they're in the free floating stage now. I'm not really in the currency markets anymore, so I couldn't really tell you about that. But, um, you know, the uh, these local currencies, they typically have a small market. They're usually, you know, for like a city. So, um, one of the oldest in the U.S., I, mean, I think maybe the oldest uh, continuing one, is the Ithaca Hours. Uh, I've actually uh, got an opportunity to go down to Ithaca, and uh, I got to talk to the, uh, the gentleman that, uh, that takes care of that a few years ago. And uh, it, was, uh, it was a very interesting situation, a very interesting uh, currency. And uh, I believe Joby Weeks was uh, actually talking to them around the time he started doing the mountain hours. So, you know, those are, are two different, uh, you know, local currencies that, you know, I'd kind of like to do as part of the interview portion of the show later. And, but there's uh, there's another currency that I like. And, you know, naturally, you know, trying to get this show out in time, I forgot to, uh, to bring out the stuff here. But, you know, when I do the show specifically on the currency, I'll be able to show them to you. Uh, there's a currency that uh, I, I really like in uh, New Hampshire. It's called the uh, Shire Silver. And it's a, it's a really neat thing. Uh, by the way, this is not a, <laughs> it's not a paid ad. But uh, it's neat because instead of using just a typical piece of paper and, and printing out uh, a currency on it, he's actually taking uh, gold and silver and, uh, and embedding it inside of a, basically a credit card sized um, laminated, uh, kind of call the currency card, but uh, you know it actually has um, kind of like a business card inside, a little bit bigger, but it you know describes you know what the the currency card is. It tells the denomination, you know, it gives you a rough value. I think it even has a, a QR code on there, so that they can uh, you know scan it and and go to the thing where it shows. You know, roughly what the value of the card would be, at least the suggested refit, yeah. Uh, but the nice thing is, you know, although there's a suggested retail, you know, there's no hard and fast rule as to how much it is. Uh, Ithaca hours, I think uh, the hour is supposed to be worth like about 10 bucks. So one Ithaca hour is supposed to be worth 10 bucks. And, uh, but that's not the case with the, you know, the kind of precious metal trading cards. The smallest one I think runs in roughly at a dollar and for a while the most expensive one was running around 40 but uh, as I was doing some research uh, just the other day I was seeing that he actually has some that go to a much higher value now so that's kind of a cool thing so we'll actually and I've already talked to, to uh, Ron Helwig about being on the show and uh, he's excited he's uh, trying to, well I don't know about excited but He's getting his, uh, his situation together so he can actually uh, do Skype with us. So um, anybody who has got a, a, a local currency out there, though, uh, I'd like to eventually talk to him as part of this series. And although you know I, I was a little familiar with Ron and I had invited him first, I mean, I'd, whoever I can 